What an honor. You probably know Christine Shore. She's here. She's here. I'm not going to try to give her a title because, as we saw in the film, she's she's not into those. <laughs> um, ben, I'm sure there's. You have to hit the switch up. Yeah, you got that. I knew this guy when he was a 19 or 20. 21. 21. 21. Look at that. You know, top hats. And now he is middle age. <laughs> he got more white hair than me. <laughs> I don't dye my hair, by the way. Do I need a mic? Where's the mic? Take this. What's the mic? I think. Oh, oh, I'll have that. All right. Thank you, Swah. You gave me a beer. Um, I'm just going to get this started with Ben because I feel like he gets this question pretty often is there's so many great characters, so many great subjects, of course. What's the genesis of this project? How did you first get introduced to, to Christine? Yeah, uh, me and my co-director, Violet, we met Christine in her documentary class. She was our oh. professor at NYU. And uh, we started working together and we started hanging out with Christine, you know, spending a lot of time at her apartment, smoking cigarettes, talking about films. <laughs> And one day she brought this footage to us and said, hey, I've been sitting on this for 27 years. I'm not quite sure what to do with it. Why don't you take a look? And it was very clear right away how important this footage was and how beautifully it had been preserved. And we kind of came up, there wasn't enough of it to cut into a film of its own. So we came up with the idea, you know, what if we follow you as you return to the subject matter and, and reunite with these men and things kind of snowballed from there. Absolutely, in a beautiful way, of course. And, and Christine, when you handed off that hard drive of the newly dis digitized footage, did you know there'd be a documentary that came out of it? Hell what were you? No. <laughs> Hell no. Okay, I shot the film when he was 21, a young, young man, and there were a bunch of Asians. How many of you uh, 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 left China? Well, Less than a dozen uh, in my yeah. in my in my group, but yeah. altogether probably. You know, Chinese all look like I have no <laughs> idea which one is more important. <laughs> there was a young man, him, good looking, uh, yeah, and then there was very formal, straightforward guy, interesting, you know, Yan um, Zhangxi, yeah, who happened to be the scholar. Then there was the other guy who was a little goofy and always dressed sort of nice. And uh, he was, um, or not, happened to be the founder of the equivalent to IBM in, in, in China. So I had a camera <laughs> and I was filming. There were a lot of people, I didn't know who to focus, but instantly, it gave me some kind of uh, perspective. Let me do the character that who is diametr diametrically opposite, okay? Yeah. And that's what I filmed him. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing that the footage became alive because I've been sitting in the storage for 27 years. I went back to China many times, offered the footage to the Chinese government. Oh, we don't want to touch it. And it, it was a shot in 16 millimeter. So I never saw the image. It was a negative. And it was recorded on a quarter inch. So I never hear. I never heard of what they say. Ultimately, whatever year was when my old friend Ang Lee won an Oscar, Live of Pi, I was like, hey, you're not from same China from, you know, you're not from mainland, he's from Taiwan. Can you give me some money to digitize this? He <laughs> said, how much? I had no idea. So he sent me a check and I digitized, I, I processed the film and digitized. Then I had to digitize the sound. Lord, because at the time it was only me and Ronald was doing the production. 
We didn't have a slate, so I had to have someone to match the picture and the sound. Interesting. This young man want to become a filmmaker, and he happened to be Han Dun's son. Han Dun is a composer for Crouching Tiger. All right, free, free, free uh, 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 labor. So he spent the whole summer syncing up between picture and sound. And I sat there, I had no idea what to do. I said, that's when Ben and Viola approached me. That's amazing. And I'm, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions too, so we are going to throw the audience for questions, so just get them top of mind. But we were, obviously, we see in that footage that Christine shot how crazy your life was at that time. Do you remember that moment? Do you remember her filming you in, in those press conferences and such? <laughs> I mean, Christine is a, is a person hard to, uh, like, uh, just be forgotten <laughs> once you see her and then I think yeah, I, I even answered in the film like uh, among like uh, two dozens of uh, her camera. camera you remember her camera first of all is a it's a film camera it's a, that it's different to begin with and then the skinny lady and then pushing people around and then, uh, and then all the journalists are trying to get into the front but she always managed to though you think those journalists would be very aggressive but hey you haven't seen Christine. <laughs> so, uh, yes, she left. A, uh, and then also she interviewed me, of course. So I, I did remember that. And um, uh, it was a really a, a good feeling to see her again in Taipei uh, when they flew over and we talk about the concept of exile. <clears throat> exile is not a concept common to people. I mean, in 21st century, I can probably name all the exiles there in the world. I mean, probably, I don't know, 200, maybe more, okay. Uh, the one famous we do know is Dalai Lama, and, uh, uh, but, uh, but really living in a, a life of exile is something that um, I, I don't expect other people to really understand. And then we talked about a lot about that, and then I just want to say, I guess Ben and V, well, like a good student of Christian, and then just like in the film, it says use your visual communication to live, to tell the story. And then I, I hope that after the screening, you after you watch this and you think you are told, you have been told a good story, you have been told you have had a, some concept of this cruel concept, cruel idea of exiles. So uh, for that, I think uh, Ben and Violet have um, deserved, I mean, they deserve the credit. And then Christian is a wonderful character to navigate us through with her unique character. <laughs> <laughs> In such a great way. And so, yeah, uh, we touches on that is, you know, obviously this is you could very easily make a film just on Christine. You know, obviously we've all seen that, but I love that you're making a film about her while she's doing the thing that she loves and is passionate about making films. And so you get to see her go on this journey of completing this beautiful film about something that people do not talk about enough. So when did that, when you handed this footage, when did the whole structure of, okay, let's make it about her give them just enough to know who she is, see her at Sundance, see her with the Black Panthers, and then move on to this incredible story <laughs> that people do not talk about enough about what happened in China. Yeah, I mean, for the first, you know, when we first started talking about the film, it was just Christine, but we didn't, we didn't really shot anything. We just sort of thought it'd be great to make a movie about Christine. And then when she turned the footage over to us, we pretty quickly conceptualized almost what you see as it is now, flashing back and forth. Uh, but for the first year of shooting, we couldn't find work as she, or mm. yeah, just she or Juan Renan. So we shot a lot of Christine's backstory then. No, because nobody want to tell us where they were. Mm. Mm. Self I wasn't hiding. <laughs> the people who I knew in New York, United States, they were self-censored. Mm. They did not want to tell me where he was, mm. yeah, just she. Wrong or not. You would easily find and they were Chinese. <laughs> they, they, 
<laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, I think, you know, it, it took a lot of time in the edit. Uh, and our editor, Connor Smith, is here tonight. On the, oh, there he is in the oh, yeah. back. Please, please get a round of applause. Yeah. Please, please. Is there anybody else in the film uh, that's involved in the film that's here? Uh, yeah, our composers, Onyx Collective, are here as well. Oh, please, round of applause. There you go. Uh, yeah, we had an amazing team. Our whole post and production team were great. So. And so that came very quickly. But then, as far as the execution, what was the new footage? What was the pro progression of new footage that you guys filmed after you had this hard drive? Well, one day I told them I'm going to Paris for vacation. They said they're coming along with me, with the film crew. I said, well, why? That's when we filmed one road night. So I never had a vacation. <laughs> yeah, it was lots of shooting and stops and starts, you know, like when we could afford to or when Christine was going on vacation, as she said, we would tag along and, uh, you know, we sort of pieced the film together. And then uh, when we were shooting more and more, but when COVID came, we had to stop shooting and it forced us into post, which I think was a blessing in disguise. Mm. And oh, you had, uh, we had some good uh, beer and I mean, the film, Record it in Taipei. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. What was the progression of the exiles as far as the shoots, and how did you contact everybody and get that time? It's uh, sort of just as it is in the film, very mm -hmm. chronological. We got in touch with Kaishi first, and Kaishi told us how to get in touch with the Anjashi, who was the hardest to find. Uh, we had heard he was in Florida. We were looking on like message boards. Uh, but it turned out he was in Maryland, about four hours away. Uh, and then he told us where to find Juan Renan, so it's sort of chronological as you see in the film. So, Kashi, I just want to hear, you know, obviously you're, you're famous for the work that you're doing with activism and, and commentating where you live now. Uh, and people are coming to you for a lot of opinions on new issues in China. As far as somebody coming to you and wanting to make a new piece of work about what you experienced at that time, you know, how do you feel about that? How is it for you to process that? And do you still have hopes for that message being expanded? I wasn't going to take this opportunity to advertise that actually I became a film a producer, a documentary <laughs> a, a producer myself. Well, it's a beautiful form. So let's give yes. a round of applause for that and see all of your films, of course. Uh, it's called uh, Freedom, the Becoming, uh, that uh, we, uh, I interviewed 10 of my fellow exiles uh, to ask them about their concepts of their understanding, their uh, the becoming. Mm -hmm. just like uh, the film's title of the concept of freedom. Well, we fought for freedom and we lost our freedom to live in our own home. Or then we were cast away into countries like United States, France, Taiwan, uh, Portugal, uh, United Kingdom, like those people who live in uh, France. And uh, did I say France? Okay. <clears throat> so in uh, uh, supposedly the, the, the freest place in the world so but being in exile how do they I think about that so that was my film so probably answered your question a little yeah. <laughs> thank you yeah absolutely and uh, I want to make sure we get out to you guys as well I'm sure you have a lot of questions and this is a great audience so if you have any questions just throw your hands up it's a bit of a fireside right here yes you sir can you hear me yeah absolutely um, first of all great film thank you uh, my question is for Mr. Uh, one of the things that was very fascinating uh, that you kind of touched on was like your identity, My your, what? your multiple it's identities okay. that you have, mm -hmm. as far as you being Uyghur, you being Chinese, identity. you being French, you being, you know, an exile, you being like all these different things. Like when you move through the world, like how do you see yourself even now where you're sitting? Does that change or are you kind of like just, you know, uh, how, how do you identify yourself essentially? You know? It's like, <clears throat> you put yourself in a scenario and you can't easily find an answer. Well, I was born in, I'm a, I'm a Uyghur. There's nothing, I mean, the, the term in, in when I first uh, emerged into exile, uh, people don't really know, but these days you do hear about this term a lot uh, due to very, very difficult, very unfortunate circumstances. And then also, like, I was born in, in, in in Beijing, I was the leader of this this great movement, and then even in this film, you hear me 
referring myself a lot as Chinese, uh, like, and then talking about the great Chineseness and things like that. And then the later part of the film about Taiwan, I find how beautiful it is. Um, I also mentioned, like, I, I am Uyghur by blood, uh, Chinese by birth, and Taiwanese by choice. But would they conflict among each other? Could be. So what you do is you ask yourself the question, what if China invade Taiwan? Where, 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 where would you find yourself in? I find myself in the front line of defense. So that become easy at that moment. If China invade Taiwan, I would be Taiwanese more than Chinese. And then if uh, uh, and today, uh, when uh, millions of Uyghur people were in concentration camp, and then just last week in Taipei, and then in, in Brussels, uh, uh, we had International Uyghur Forum, and then I, met, I said, today, the Western world really needs to, to, to um, get out of the Chinese narrative. Whenever Uyghur people fight for, uh, demand for independence, the Chinese narratives jump in and say, that's separatist movement, and the, the United States cannot, or, or the whole world cannot support them. And then actually, you know what? These United States follow the Chinese narratives. We, we, can, we can support Uyghur for human rights, for democracy, for liberty, but we cannot really support your independence. And so why not? If Scotland can fight for their independence in the United Kingdom and in, in Quebec can fight for their independence, why United States simply cannot or have to denounce a separatist movement? That's what I said last week, actually, in, in Brussels. Uh, so it it it, it, it seems there is a change between 1989 until now. Like I was saying, Great China, and then now today I'm Uyghur independence, and then the real synchronization or the real um, um, the answer for for your question is that uh, I, I believe I am a citizen of freedom. And, uh, and, and then as whenever the conflict, if you put yourself in a, in a scenario to think about this, like, uh, would, I, would I consider myself a Uyghur who, is a, who belong to East Turkestan, a, a country that was once found now in, uh, annexed by China? Or all these kind of, kind of questions that as long as you use the, uh, the guidelines of, uh, uh, of freedom, you have your clear answer. So uh, I hope one day, I hope in this life, my, my one day, that there will be a free China, free East Turkestan, of course, already an exemplary democracy. And then I'm very proud to report to you that many Taiwanese people tells me, like, it's good to have you in Taiwan, that I would like to hear that from China and from East Turkestan, that I can enjoy switching from the three passports or enjoy having all of them yeah. and then and then appear or the three countries a uh, free countries would also welcome me so thank you oh yeah great question and well said sir yeah. absolutely um is another question yeah you ma'am um in your clip um in the in the film which is a great film by the way um, you know, seeing you in Congress in 2019, you, you said you felt betrayed and you urged them to do something before it was too late. Do you think seeing the Chinese trade and the relationship now, do you think it is too late for the U.S. to do anything? I'm sure you have heard the term never too late, right? <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, uh, so well, if we get philosophical, yes, never too late. But uh, I, I think um, I remember a, a good friend of mine who is a chain smoker, and then and then he used this uh, "never too late" argument mm -hmm. to say things. You said "never too late," I'll just uh, I'll quit later. You know <laughs> that "never too late" doesn't mean like "never too late." <laughs> and then when I think the United States have already found itself in a very difficult position to uh, shift from uh, its appeasement policy to uh, a more direct sh uh, value, shared, uh, shared value uh, position uh, for, uh, together with other democracies. And, uh, oh, to say value-based position. Mm -hmm. 
for a long time, the United States has been in an interest base. Uh, and then the interest has been interpreted by uh, people like Henry Kissinger. And uh, he is 99 years old now, fabulously rich. And he, <laughs> his company charged $1 million retainer fee just to become his company's client. You have to pay $1 million to access China's market. And he is the main architect of United States China policy. Guys, there's something fundamentally wrong in this picture. <clears throat> so, uh, so, um, uh, uh, but I think United States is coming around. In the re um, United States is coming around to realize the price we pay today, if we don't, we have to pay much higher in the future. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, are, there are consequences either way. You just have to weigh in. And then I think America, I think, I hope, is coming around. And then that's because of the Uyghur people's sacrifice. That's because of Hong Kong people's uh, uh, sacrifice in the last year, last few years, and then oh, I think it's also because the mask you're wearing today, and you just your city and your street and your friends and family falling for this pandemic, and you realize the the so-called economically engaged partner uh, that uh, is holding their uh, mask or their 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 uh, those medical equipment. I forgot the tame, uh, the name of. Uh, of terms of them when the beginning EVE. yes yes EVE or something. <laughs> at the beginning they hold that you know uh, it's a bargaining chip against you even in today in the, in the day when the whole mankind face a pandemic where we have a strong suspicion of its origin then the American policymakers in Washington DC realized we probably have done something wrong. Those dissident, uh, they have been warning us, but we have just decided because they are dissidents, they have to be on the far end of the spectrum of opinions. But 30 years later, like I've, uh, uh, like Ben have filmed and uh, showed in this film, is uh, take me no pleasure, come back and say, I told you so. And then I think the policymakers in Washington is coming around and say, yeah, 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 they are dissident. They are on the far side of the spectrum. That doesn't mean they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we are coming around. We are coming around a little. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was the last chance oh. we had for a question, guys. We have to wrap up. I understand there's a reception, and you can always, you can obviously contact them after the fact. And yeah. Ben, can you please Thank send you. people to what, whatever site or where should people go to support this film and keep it going? Uh, yeah, we have an Instagram account. It's Exiles Film on Instagram or Exiles Doc on Twitter. Your follow absolutely. Um, and yeah, we'll be around at the reception if everyone wants to has any more questions. We'd love to uh, talk to you. Round of applause, guys. We have Christine Moore.